So as we continue on with today's program, there seems to be a thread emerging on today's show. There seems seems to be, I guess, a a theme that that is loosely connecting everything we've talked about. And that theme seems to be liberals getting so upset that they can no longer dominate discussion that they are trying to do everything they can to stymie discussion and to keep certain ideas and certain types of discussion from even occurring. Not, Not that they want to debate the ideas, they want to prevent the debate from happening. And so we've had a couple of examples of that. So as, as we get as we get towards the end of today's program, let's um, let's go through a couple of additional examples of some recent cases where we've seen this. I want to start off with a Breitbart article. Oh no, not Breitbart! They're on the fake news list. Well, they're not fake news, but someone's going to say they are. But hey, I'm, I'm going to read from them anyway. What, what, what's going to happen? Are the fake news Nazis going to come and find me and send me to the fake news concentration camp because I'm reading from a Breitbart article over the airwaves? <laughs> Good luck with that. No, this is from Breitbart. It is a, uh article entitled Austrian Press Council. Don't report anything that could stir up prejudices. Reading directly from the article here. In a checklist on responsible reporting on migrants... Austria's press council instructs journalists to omit any information that could stir up prejudices. The checklist by the self-regulatory institution, which enforces a code of ethics for the country's media, the press council, also advises journalists to leave out names if they're foreign-sounding and asks them to consider whether stories can be left open for comments without having to fear the discussion getting out of hand before publishing them. Warning that the topic of refugees is discussed emotionally and controversially, not just among the general public, but also by the media in Austria. The press council proclaims the list gives reporters a chance of self-reflection and provides them with practical guidelines. The first points in the checklist ask reporters to consider whether they would report the wrongful behavior if it had not been committed by a migrant, whether the topic has been adequately researched, and to reflect on whether they have presented the facts that are required for a comprehensive and balanced reporting of their topic. Following on, most of the subsequent press council directives appear to make self-censorship of stories so as to avoid causing prejudice, the primary focus of responsible journalism and refugee reporting. Yeah, that's right, folks. Don't report the facts. Avoid causing prejudice instead. Journalists are asked to think about whether their reporting, whether their reporting, choice of words, or selection of photos could strengthen prejudices, and whether information that could stir up prejudices could be left out without changing the meaning and true content of the story or impairing readers' understanding of the subject. The list also warns reporters to check whether a piece contains any other information in a piece that might thwart their intentions not to inflame prejudice, e.g. not mentioning a person's origin but mentioning a foreign, last na- foreign first name the press council suggests. It adds, Note, the mere naming of the origin of a suspected criminal, foreigner, asylum seeker, migrant is not an ethical infringement according to the current practice of the press council senate. However, journalists should weigh up whether it's required for the reader's understanding. Before publishing a story regarding migrants, the press council also asks reporters and people working in the media to consider whether they can open an internet forum on the topic without having to fear the discussion gets out of hand. Comments under the checklist are largely skeptical of the points, with one reader declaring, this is a checklist for self-censorship. Do not be surprised if you are less and less believed. The press council sees itself as a modern self-regulatory institution in the press sector, which serves editorial quality assurance as well as ensuring freedom of the press. In November, a comment piece in the business special supplement of News Magazine, which argued that Angela Merkel's decision to open Europe's borders will have disastrous consequences, fell foul of the council. According to its ruling, the Press Council Senate found particularly problematic the article's assertion that Muslim migrants have not come to integrate, a statement which they say fosters prejudices and fears. The judgment also condemned as unethical that the piece attributed very negative attitudes and characteristics to Muslim migrants and said the article gives the reader the impression that these immigrants are backward. So that article coming from Breitbart.com by Virginia Hale, December the 12th. 2016. 
And yes, I know it's Austria. I know you, you may think that, well, there's no connection here to America, but think of the things that article talked about. Are we not seeing the press in America do such similar self-censorship here whenever there's yet another Muslim terrorist attack? They do it quite frequently. But go back to the basic idea of that article. The basic idea that this, that this council was putting forth was that it was more important to avoid prejudices and avoid bias and avoid printing anything that might lead to bias and prejudice than it is to actually report the facts or to actually analyze the events. Folks, that's chilling. I mean, I know that here in America we look at terms like bias and prejudice and and we think of them in pejorative ways. We think of them almost as dirty words. But if you take a step back, and you actually think about it, what are biases and prejudice? Well, bias and prejudice are just two more defense mechanisms that we humans use to protect ourselves and defend ourselves. For example, if you were sitting in your home in your neighborhood and you had seen over the last few days some scruffy-looking, unkempt man driving around the neighborhood in a white panel van... Would you not maybe keep your child indoors until you didn't see him anymore? Would you maybe not let your kid play out in the yard or not go walking down the street to the friend's house or whatever? You probably would, right? I mean, you want to protect your kid. Now, why are you doing that? Well, you're doing that because of a bias against people who look like child molesters and because you have a prejudice against child molesters. Now, is that wrong? No, that's being a good parent. That's taking care of your child. That's taking care of your family. Now, we don't know that the scruffy-looking guy in the white panel van is a child molester. He may not be. He may be totally some totally innocent guy minding his own business. That's well and good. But in any case, you're not going to take a chance, are you? Of course not. You're going to do what you can to protect your child, protect your kids, protect your family, and it would be ridiculous for anybody to criticize you for doing so. Well, likewise, with the other biases and prejudices we have in this world, each and every day, each one of us is in a constant state of threat assessment. All of the people that you and I come in contact with, even if it's just passing them on a street a day, in a given day, we're always wondering who's the person that's a threat, who's not. And as we do that, well, it's a game of incomplete information. We never have complete information on anybody. So, yeah, guess what? Our biases and our prejudices play a role, at least in the starting point, of making that judgment. Now, that doesn't mean our biases and prejudices are always correct. It doesn't mean that we won't be exposed to information on an individual basis that might fly in the face of those biases and prejudices, and we you know, change what we're doing for a particular person or change our interactions with people based on that. Sure, of course we should be open to that. But they do function as at least a good starting point to start the discussion, start our analysis, start formulating what our plan of action is. So bias and prejudice are not things to be universally decried, not things to be universally avoided. Indeed, they are quite necessary when it comes to protecting our lives and the lives and the property of our family. Perhaps on some level we should begin embracing biases and prejudices. Oh, but there's people that don't think we should do that, of course. Among them are some folks at Boston College. Again, another Breitbart article. Oh my God, you're quoting Breitbart! The fake news Nazis are going to come after you! Uh, Don't worry. This a piece from Breitbart on December 6th. Boston College faculty want to ban Trump-inspired hate speech. In response to Donald Trump's victory in November's presidential election, nearly 50 faculty members at Boston College have signed a letter demanding that the university ban all forms of hate speech. A letter signed by almost 50 Boston College faculty members condemns Donald Trump for failing to address the hate crimes that his campaign emboldened. They also condemn Trump for failing to apologize for the remarks he made about sexually assaulting women. 
The letter opens, in the wake of the presidential election, we as faculty at Boston College declare our unequivocal opposition to racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and all forms of identity-based hatred and discrimination on and off this campus. The letter calls for the university to adopt a zero-tolerance policy against hate speech. In this spirit, we call on the Boston College administration to immediately adopt a zero-tolerance policy against hate speech. Wow. So we can't have hate speech, according to them. But what if there are actually people out there that I hate? Am I supposed to speak about that? I mean, after all, again, colleges and universities and a free society in general are supposed to be environments to where, you know, you can say what you wish, you can investigate whatever... Uh, you know, whatever whatever ideas you want to investigate, you can go pursue information wherever it's at. Should we really be trying to shut down such discussion? And hey, I will admit, there's people out there I hate. There's people out there I hate because of their culture. There's people out there I hate because of their religion. There's people out there I hate because of their political affiliation. There's people I hate out there probably because of their nationality. Probably go down an endless list. And guess what? If I think those people are a danger to America, going back once again to what we just talked about in terms of biases and prejudices and their legitimate role in helping us defend ourselves, if there are people, if there are cultures, if there are political parties, if there are groups of people who I believe are detrimental to our nation or even a danger to us, yes, Muslims, I'm talking to you, then yes, I'll use my right of free speech to talk about it. Yes, I'll use this microphone to talk about it. Yes, I'll use these airwaves to talk about it. Yes, I'll use the internet to talk about it. Yes, I will give you speech on it. And yes, I guess, by the strict definition, it would be considered hate speech. And I'm proud of it. It has been our lack of hate speech in this country over the last 50 years that has driven us nearly to the brink of ruin. We must not be worried or concerned about whether or not our enemies are offended by our hate speech. In the days of World War II, did we worry whether or not what we said about the Japanese was construed as hate speech. No. You can see, among many examples, you can see a lot of Warner Brothers cartoons, Disney cartoons even, that made fun of the Japanese and the Germans in their war efforts. That would be considered hate speech today. It would be controversial today. My God, how far we've fallen. Now, the hate speech I put out may be very different than the hate speech you put out. Your hate speech might be in favor of Black Lives Matter and criticizing American culture and criticizing straight, white, Christian, heterosexual males. There's plenty of that hate speech around, but I guess that's not controversial. That type of hate speech, oh, we're not supposed to stymie that discussion. That type of hate speech results in the purveyors of it being called heroes and important voices and, and trend-setting folks, and they get a pass. But what of us who deliver the other kind of hate speech? And I will proudly say that I'm a purveyor of hate speech, given that definition. What of us? Can we say that our hate speech is somehow more objectionable? Can we say that given the threats that America faces from Muslims both overseas and on our shores from illegal immigrants, from the criminal element that's pervasive in our urban communities. Can we honestly say that that version of so-called hate speech should be avoided? Or should we instead force that discussion on the American people to finally take a look and have a discussion and come to, come to an understanding of what we need to do going forward? I think the answer is the latter, very clearly. Thank you once again for joining us on America's Evil Genius. This is Travis Cook.
We will see you next week. Godspeed, everybody.